But, but I want to start out with, with the idea that there's perspectives, right? And there's context. And as customer experience professionals, one of our biggest challenges is really understanding what the data is telling us. Um, there, there was, there was a, a little girl um, in elementary school, and, and she was given an assignment by her teacher to, to draw a picture of somebody that she really admired. And, and, and actually, it was the entire class that, that was given this assignment. And, and this particular little girl um, brought her picture in the next day. And um, it, it was kind of a, an interesting, uh, boy, you know, I'm in the technology field, and I can't even figure out how to, how to, how to run a, the, uh, how to move this forward. Um, OK, there we go. There we go. Um, and okay, I'm not having very good luck here. So bear with me while uh, I work these uh, technical difficulties out here. All right. So OK, here we go. I think we've got it now. There we go. So this was the, the picture that she brought in. It was her mom. It was her mom. Her mom was, was uh, her, her idol, right? And it, she respected her so much, and she, she brings this picture in. And, and so the teacher, I, I'm sure, was, was quite taken aback by this. And, and the next day, the teacher gets, gets a letter um, from this, this girl's mom. And she says, Dear Miss D, I wish to clarify that I'm not now, nor have I ever been an exotic dancer. I work at Home Depot, and I told my daughter how hectic it was last week before the blizzard hit. I told her we sold out of every single shovel we had. <laughs> when, when I found one more in the back room, several people were fighting over, uh, over who would get it. Her picture does not show me dancing around a pole. It's supposed to depict me selling the last snow shovel we had at Home Depot. From now on, I will remember to check her homework more. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can, I can uh, associate a little bit with this. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got a young daughter probably about the same age that uh, um, I, I just I love seeing her pictures. They're great. The thing that, I, that, that strikes me every time, though, is I, I think I know what the picture says. I, know, I think I know what it's about. And then I ask her what it is, and it's something completely different than what I thought. And of course, you have to smile. Oh, I, that's what I thought it was. That's beautiful. It looks exactly like you said. But it, it, it rarely is. And the point here is we get a lot of data, right? We, a lot of people, a lot of companies capture a lot of customer experience data, but it's the context behind that data and the perspective behind that data that really is what we need to get to um, in, in order to understand what our customers are asking for and, and what is going to create a good experience for them. Um, there, there's a, a tried, you know, kind of a, a, an old way of, of getting to really uh, the true understanding of, of, of the root of what, you know, customers are trying to say or, or even a you could apply this in root cause analysis, and there's a lot of methodologies out there on how to do this, but it's really the idea of asking the five whys, right? Um, so digging deeper and peeling back the layers of the onion to really understand what the data is telling you and what the customers are telling you. So this concept is, is pretty universal, right? Now, the details of it and, and you know, which phases are which and those types of things can probably vary a little bit between you know, your business and different, different things. But the idea is, is every customer goes through a life cycle when, when dealing with, with you as a, a vendor or a partner or, or whatever else. But there, there, are, there are defined phases. You know, we, we acquire customers. We deliver or we implement, you know, what, we deliver product, we implement solutions, we, um, we, we have this um, you kind of delivery phase. Then, then I, I like to call this next phase impress. Some people call it manage, some people call it maintain, some people call it whatever. But really, this is an opportunity to impress the customers and, and, and make them feel like they made a great decision in doing business with your company. And, and, then, and then grow. So you know, this is the idea of, well, if they're really happy with your products or they're happy with your service or your solution or whatever else, then they're going to want to do more with you. That may be you know, upsell, cross-sell. That, that could be a, you know, additional business opportunities, whatnot. And, th and, then, and then share, right? So if, if they're really uh, happy with your products or services and, and the relationship and, and the interaction that they have with you and their experience with you, then they're going to they're gonna tell other people about that. Um, now, you know, 
in, in this, it could be, you know, if it's a competition, they may tell them bad things, but um, <laughs> if, if, if it's people that they trust and, and, and that they do, um, that they want to share a good experience with, then, then they'll do that. Um, so within this life cycle, there are touch points, right? And, and I appreciate Leslie's um, um, conversation about, about the journey, right? Mapping the journey. Some people call this mapping the journey. But it, it's really kind of defining the, the customer life cycle. And what are all the touch points at each of these phases? And who's responsible for those touch points? And what, what, are, what, are, what kind of information are we gathering and sharing with our customers during these touch points? And, and, and are they what the customers are asking for? So, for instance, you know, in, in the uh, acquire stage, and I've got a hanging G there. I'm not sure how, uh, uh, how that happened. It's, at least it's not a, <laughs> a participle. But, um, so during the acquire phase, we've, we've got sales and marketing, right? And they've got a ton of interactions. You know, marketing you know, does you know, large campaigns, and, and each of these are touch points with the customer. Now, we're not physically talking to them. We're not physically um, you know, having any kind of conversation or even doing business with them at this point, but it's a touch point. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a place where the customer has some type of interaction with your business. Um, sales, you know, a lot more touch points there. That's, that's a much more interactive um, uh, uh, phase within there. Then we have order management and deployment. Um, so th this is, um, again, trying to make it kind of agnostic and, and, and work well across industries. You know, if you're a product company, you know, how, how do you deliver the product? Is it, is it in person to the customer? Do they purchase it in store? Uh, and, and receive it right there? Um, and what is their experience with that, with that process of receiving that product? What about if, if you're maybe an e-commerce company and you're shipping product? Um, you know, what, is, what is that delivery experience? Or, or deployment, what if you're, for instance, in, in the software industry, um, in the enterprise software industry, um, you know, customers purchase solutions and products and a lot of times you, know, you deploy that for them and you install that and you configure it and, and, and you customize it. But, but those are a ton of touch points. Imagine how many touch points there are there um, in, in that phase. Then we talk about you know, impress, where you know, this is really where your customer service or your technical support or you know, what other, whatever organizations you have that deal with the customers, once they've already purchased your product or service and, and are, are now kind of, um, you know, kind of on an ongoing um, um, relationship with your, cus uh, with your company. And then in, in the grow phase, here's your uh, opportunity for upsell, uh, for cross-sell, for you know, additional product sell, additional service sell. And then the share where we talk about um, you know, ref referring, you know, referrals, we talk about um, reputation. Um, in the e-commerce um, arena, you know, a, bi a, big, a big focus for them is, is, is around this reputation management, right? There's this whole component, you know, this big idea of now, now social interactions that people have online. And, and social media and, and, and moving to that because really that's, that's where a lot of these online businesses' uh, reputations lie is, is within, within the online space. And how do you manage that and, and how do you interact with your customers uh, with that? It's, it's a very touchy thing because um, within the social media uh, arena, um, you know, there's, there are rules about how you interact with your customers in that sphere. Um, you know, if somebody leaves a review on Yelp, um, or whatnot. There are rules about how you can respond or if you should respond or, or those types of things um, uh, with, with, with that arena. So it's, it's, it gets pretty complex and there's a lot of touch points, a lot of touch points. So this, this is, it's, it's, a big, it's a big idea and it's a big concept. And, and really th the key is focusing in on the most important ones that really will influence the customer experience, um, um, kind of the low hanging fruit, the ones that you get the biggest uh, the biggest return on, on your investment for, um, you know, uh, trying to affect. At each of these touch points, there is a level of friction. So when a customer interacts and, and it's easy, and it's super easy for them and it's enjoyable, it's a very low friction. That's, that's, it, it's a good experience. When it's difficult for them and, it, and it's hard and they have to sit on sit on their, you know, they call customer service and they have to sit on the phone for, you know, 20 minutes uh, before they even get to somebody. And then, and then whoever they get to doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, and, and so they have to transfer them to somebody else. And, you know, each of these touch points are, are very high friction. And it really causes the customer uh, satisfaction experience to, to, to tank. And it's, it's, a, it's a concept of of at each one of these touch points that are most important to your customers, how do you reduce that friction level 
um, that, that they experience. When this is, this is not just customers, I think this is just human nature. When, when we're faced with enough friction or, or enough, um, enough obstacles, or if things become difficult for us, then I think we all seek the path of least, of least resistance, right? So if a customer is having a really miserable experience trying to get help on the customer service line, or if they're continually having to call because of problems that they're having with your products, um, they're gonna get to the point where that's really hard for them. And they don't want things to be hard, they want things to be easy, and they want them to be simple. And they will find another path, which means that most likely they will find another company to do business with that will make things easier for them. I would, I do, as a consumer. I do that all the time. Now, how do we do that? What is, the, what is the solution for reducing friction points? Well, the solution is ball bearings. It's all about ball bearings. I don't know if any of you are Fletch fans, but uh, there was a, <laughs> we can have a, a, a fun conversation over, uh, over, over dinner or, or drinks one night if, if, if you're a fan. But, but the idea is that we want to reduce the friction point. What, what are these ball bearings? Well, the first thing is to establish listening posts. Uh, I call them listening posts at the touch points. So you want, you want to, to create a mechanism for being able to capture um, the, the customer um, experience at those, at those touch points. Um, I think that a lot of customer experience, um, you know, companies that are focused on customer experience uh, look, things, look at things at, at the macro level, right? We do net promoter, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, uh, customer experience outsourcing companies who will do data, there's Walker, there's a lot of different companies who will aggregate, you know, high level customer experience data for you, right? Um, it's, it's really kind of at a macro level. What I'm talking about here is, is, is getting into the micro level and being able to establish uh, institutionalized um, uh, listening points uh, at these touch points. So if you, you, know, you have a customer, ex, uh, customer service organization, um, you want to be able to capture and, and, and gather um, uh, important information about that interaction with your customer um, uh, in, in order to really understand uh, what the experiences are at those touch points because you can't improve, you can't reduce the friction if you don't know what's causing the friction. You need to identify, now, um, you know, I, th I don't think it's just in my industry. I think it's pretty universal because I've worked, as, as an e-commerce outsourcer, you work with a lot of different companies. You work with retail, you work with, um, um, you know, all sorts of different companies. And I think it's pretty universal that we really like to make words up and, or acronyms. I think everybody, I mean, <laughs> you know, that this, this sounds really funny, but uh, McAfee, we're, we're a subsidiary of Intel. And, and at Intel, we have a, we, we actually have a ac an acronym matrix that we give to all the employees. It's like five pages long of just all the acronyms and what, what they mean on there. And it, it's, it's kind of funny, but I guess, I guess we try to shorten everything. But, but we really like to make up words. And, um, dissatisfiers. I, I looked it up in the dictionary and I actually did not find that in the dictionary, dissatisfiers. So I just want to be transparent with everybody that yes, I'm making words up. Um, I'm doing my best uh, George W. Bush impersonation. And, and, but but it, it's, very, um, it's very descriptive of, of what, we, what, what it is. It's, they're dissatisfiers. There's, at these touch points where there is friction, that, those are dissatisfiers for our customers. So you really need to assess the impact because the impact is not equal. Volume does not necessarily equate to impact, right? Because if you have something that is just a little bit annoying and it happens a million times, that may have a much smaller impact than one thing that happens that's catastrophic that you know, drives a customer away. So you need to make sure that you're assessing both the, the, the frequency and the severity uh, of these dissatisfiers as you look at them then you have to prioritize them. You know, what is most important? Um, now, this, this is a very subjective question because most companies, I think, traditionally say, well, you know, we want to look at our dissatisfiers and we want to understand what, what's the on the uh, dissatisfying our customers. But we will want to prioritize them based on what's easiest for us. Uh, we want to prioritize them based on what we can do because, you know, we're really not set up to do these things, so we're going to take these other things. Well, I think the problem with that is that's not what your customers are asking for. Um, and sometimes it's pretty inconvenient for us as companies to change things uh, to benefit the customer. 
and a lot of times we, we, we want to change what's easiest for us and not what is going to make it best for the customer. Then we need to implement improvement initiatives. Now, boy, this sounds really boring. Im improvement initiatives, that's, like, that's bedtime stuff, right? Uh, in, it's your cure for insomnia. This, this we, we want to make sure that the, the improvements that you put, they don't, they don't have to be huge, major initiatives. They don't have to be a big Six Sigma, you know, massive, you know, initiative that takes a year or two to implement, and by the time you implement it, the whole business, you know, has changed and out from underneath you, and you, you come out the other side, and now all of a sudden you have this big, you know, process or something that you've implemented that doesn't even apply anymore. Um, but they can be small, targeted, um, agile, um, um, you know, wins at these touch points that will really dramatically, you know, each one may be small impact, but when, the, when you add them all up, uh, the culmination of them all will have a dramatic impact for your customers. Um, and then, of course, you want to measure because you want to make sure that, you know, are, are the things that you're doing actually impacting the customer experience? Now, this is, this is a little bit more difficult one, right? Because the, the macro customer experience metrics that we, that we use to measure are, are more long-term metrics, right? I mean, if, if you want your net promoter score to increase by 5% for a particular uh, um, a customer, you know, th that's not something you can make a change and then next month measure it and then all of a sudden you see the impact, right? I mean, this is, it, it takes time for, first of all, the customer to really gain faith in you again and really kind of change their perception of you. It, it takes even longer to kind of get the survey results back. It takes longer to ask, you know, uh, uh, measure or, um, you know, analyze those survey results and really come up. So th th these are longer term things and so what you want to do is you want to put in smaller measurements that are particularly targeted on what you have implemented to assess whether that's been uh, impactful or not. Now, we'll talk a little bit about that here in, in a minute. Um, and then when you measure, I've never personally Im implemented a customer experience improvement initiative um, that we got perfect on the first try. Um, it was like, oh, this is exactly what we wanted. We're done and wash our hands and, and, and we move on to the next one. That never happens. Um, that's, a, that's an urban legend. Um, it's like the Yeti. It's, it's, uh, you think you see it and you turn and it's gone. And, and it, it, it just doesn't happen that way. So you, you have to reassess and, and learn from what you've implemented and, and what the data is telling you and then be able to make tweaks and, and, and improvements in that. And it's an, on, it's an ongoing, it's a journey. It's an ongoing thing because what, um, you know, whose business, I want to see a raise of hand, whose business stands still and never changes ever? Yeah, I, I know ours does. In fact, it, it, it changes daily. So that assessment piece and that improvement piece is, is an ongoing journey. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, something that, that I've, I did recently with, with McAfee. And, and this was a, a targeted initiative because what we did is, is, is we had some, some listening posts with our, with our large enterprise customers. Um, so these are, these are our customers that have invested, you know, um, not, not just a lot of money with McAfee, but you know they, they put their security in our hands, and that's a, that's kind of a big a big burden to have on your shoulders, and, and something that can certainly keep you up at night. Um, and and so we 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 put touch points in, and, and a lot of our big customers, the the, the profile of our largest customers, um, are, are mainly finance and government um, and and large um, uh, corporations that have a lot of sensitive. Um, data or sensitive um, information. And, and, and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to really understand from them how we could be a better partner with them because I, I think the challenge is, is, is with a lot of our customers, the way they view McAfee, and, and not just McAfee, the way they view all of their vendors is, is as a vendor. They're, they're a, a company that does, we pay them for doing something on our behalf and you know we will kind of uh, browbeat them into submission until they do it how we want them to do it and at the price we want them to do it at and so um, you know there, there are all sorts of classes that these that these uh, companies send their their employees to and, and their management to to learn specifically how to manage vendors right I mean this is this is a, 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 an art form uh, for a lot of them and it's not it's not a very good art form it's, it's kind of a 
uh, I guess it would be like you know a, a type of uh, uh, camp that uh, you know people would send uh, <laughs> people when they when they want to uh, you know create a sweatshop or something I, I don't know something that uh, is not very friendly to the people that are working for you right and and so it, it, it was it was very difficult for us to change it, it's it's a constant struggle to try to change that perception into more of a partner perception where listen we are just invested we are as invested in your business as you are because if your business doesn't do well we don't do well um, if, if your business has vulnerabilities that's our problem and just as much as your problem because literally our business depends upon you being safe and your environment being safe and you not having any vulnerabilities and so we, we wanted to, to, to listen. Now, we had an advantage because we have account teams at these large customers, and so we have a direct um, way of, of gathering information and feedback from these customers. But what we really wanted to understand is how are we doing as a partner, and what could we do, be doing better? The feedback that we received overwhelmingly was that they didn't feel like we, they were having peer-to-peer -peer relationships, meaning their, C, their CIO, you know, in, in the security industry, it, it, it kind of depends on the business as to who is the top person um, that's over, over security. Some have a chief security officer, which reports to the president. Some have a, a, uh, a, a chief information officer who reports to the president that has the security under their purview. But the bottom line was their top person over security at the C level um, didn't feel like they had a, relation, a peer relationship within our company. And, and they, they saw that as, as a hindrance to creating a really valuable partnership, which I agree with. Um, they, they also told us that the access and interaction with engineering level resources, uh, they, they wanted more, they wanted to have some of that. I mean, not just more of that, they wanted to have any of that. And it's kind of funny because if you look at that, you say, well, one's like way up here and the other one's way down here, right? We've got the, the C-level people wanting more interaction and we've got the administrators, the, the, the bottom people wanting more interaction. So, you know, what, what is that telling us? It's, well, they, they, they want to feel like we're a partner. They don't want us to, to feel like, you know, they've got a salesperson that comes by, you know, uh, every quarter saying, hey, it's the end of the quarter. We need to meet our quota. Let's, let's, let's do some business. Um, so we, we wanted to, um, you know, they, they just wanted more interactions throughout that at different levels. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest pain points for them was um, product enhancement requests. And, and in, this, in this industry, every, every customer's environment is different. And, and it's a challenge because customers want to do things with our products that don't, that we can't do out of the box um, because of the, the, the uniqueness of their environments. And so they, they often, um, you know, if, if we can't, you know, provide services for them to kind of create that with some kind of, uh, you know, um, modification of, 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 of the solution and they need actual core uh, product changes in order to do what they're trying to do, then they, they, they submit what are called product enhancement requests. And that was a miserable process for our customers. They, the feedback we got was they, they submit this in and we, you know, we, we had a tool for them to do it. Problem is, is when, when they submitted it into the tool, it went into a black hole from their perspective. There was no feedback. You know, hey, we received your, your request and you know, we're looking at it. And, and uh, you know, there was no feedback you know, down um, um, through the process to say, hey, you know what? Um, we think this is probably a really good idea, and so we're considering it for a future release of our product. Or, you know, there's just no communication. And so they would try to, you know, to ask their salesperson or their account manager, and, you know, well, what's the status on this? And they couldn't really even get an answer. They'd go back to the team and say, oh, well, you know, we're evaluating it. Um, and that's about as much as they would get. So that was a, a miserable thing for them. And then understanding how to get help and, and get questions answered. So it's one thing. So when a customer would buy our product, we would, have you know, the salesperson give them a packet of a welcome packet, right? And it would have support phone numbers and it would have, you know, his contact information. It would have a list of the products that they purchased and, and, and this, that, and the other. The problem is, is that usually would go to the, the, the person that, you know, the decision maker. So it would go to, you know, a director level person or a VP level person. And that would go up and it would be filed away in their, in their uh, a bookcase. And then the, the administrators that are actually managing our product day to day um, would have no idea that they even got that packet. And so they would kind of flail around and they'd have to call our salesperson, hey, where do I go? I have the support number, but what if I don't need support? What if I just have questions? And they just didn't know really how 
the right way to go about getting answers to their questions was, uh, were. So what we did is, is, is we took a look at, um, this is just a template, um, at, 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 and we took an impact assessment. So we basically just kind of ranked each of these kind of touch point feedback uh, areas with you know, what the frequency and the severity um, were of, of those in our customers' eyes. Um, we, we, we took an approach where we didn't look at it from our eyes, we looked at our customers. So what we did is we, we came up with some, some potential solutions and actually had our account teams go out to the customer and say, hey, listen, if, which of these are most important to you, first of all? You tell me what causes you the most pain. And then, and then uh, if, if, if these are your biggest pain points, then here's some ideas that we had. Which, which, are, which would be most interesting? Which, which do you feel would reduce your pain in this the most? And, and we got direct feedback from, um, from our, our largest customers on that to, to understand that. So um, what we did is we took the feedback that we got and, and we, we created some targeted um, um, solutions, I guess we call them solutions, to, to those pain points for, for our customers. Um, one of the things that we did is we, we created these, these technical webinars, we call them our, our tech talks. And we invite um, our top customers, um, their administrative level folks, to join these webinars. And these are interactive webinars. This isn't a presentation from a marketing person on the product and how cool it is and all these really neat features. I mean, these are administrators that probably know more about the product because they use it every day and have to manage it every day than anybody in the whole marketing organization would know. And so we actually bring in um, development engineers, we bring in our sustaining engineers, we bring in our, our in, in a, within our support organization, we have different tiers and our, the, the most skilled tier um, or we call it our, our tier three organization. Um, they have engineers that are very good. We have some of our professional services consultants, as well as some of our systems engineers that are out in the field that assist in the sales process um, that are really highly skilled. We have, you know, just um, depending on the topic and, and, and what we're discussing, we try to bring in the most knowledgeable people in the company around that product or, or around that, that topic um, to actually have an interactive conversation with a, a, a group um, and we try to keep the group small enough to where it can be interactive uh, of, of our customers' administrators. And they actually have conversations around, hey, there's some tips and tricks about this product. It's not really in the documentation, but you, know, you can do these things. And they started having this you know, you know, peer-to-peer conversation, you know, technical person to technical conversation. Of course, when I'm on these, it's just kind of all over the top of my head. I have no idea if like, even what they're saying is right or not. But, but the idea is the customers really, really appreciate that they can actually have a conversation with, with our engineers, which a lot of companies in the software industry kind of, they put them in this box. It's, it's kind of like this you know, impenetrable, you know, opaque box, and nobody can see their engineers, and they just have them down in this sweatshop, no windows, and they're drinking coffee and Red Bull, and they're just hacking code out. And we didn't, we didn't want to do that. We, we want to op open that up. And you know, of course, it's always a dangerous thing having actual engineers uh, speak with customers. Uh, if, if any of you are in customer management, that's kind of a scary thought, right? That's like, oh, what are they, uh, what are they gonna say? But, but the customers love it and they appreciate it. And you know what, if one of those engineers says something kind of crazy every once in a while, you know what, it's, it's, it's really, you know, PR usually doesn't call me that often. Every once in a while they do, but, but it's, it's well worth it because of, of, the, of the goodwill and the, the feedback that we've gotten out of this program is, is overwhelming um, from our customers at the administrative level. In fact, one of the things that was, I, I suspected may come out of this, but, but, um, but it, it's really gratifying to see that it, it did, and it was never part of the, the design, is this has is, this is created a lot of additional uh, revenue opportunities for us, because as we start talking, they're like, oh, that's really great, and you know what, I can see how this would work with the other product, and the administrative people start connecting the dots on how this all works together, um, and, and, they, and it creates additional opportunities for us. Um, we also did this, what we call the annual state of the business. Now this state of the business reviews with our top customers. This is not a new concept. I mean, companies have QBRs, uh, their quarterly business reviews, and you know, they have annual meetings and, and those types of things all the time. The, 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 the difference is, is, is what, we've, what we have designed this review to be. First of all, we have made it mandatory for all of our top, we have a top customer program, mandatory for all those that their account teams hold us on an annual basis, and we track it. 
and, and we actually provide data for them to take to the customer. So we review, you know, how have we done this last year? Um, you know, we, we, we review kind of all their support issues and their product enhancement requests, and, and we review um, their big initiatives that they've had over the past year, and if we've got some kind of, uh, you know, uh, engagement for uh, services uh, in there, we review that. But then, the, really, the real important thing that customers really appreciate is we say, okay, let's talk about what you're doing this coming year. Let's talk about what are your goals, what are you trying to do as a business, not with our products, what are you trying to accomplish as a business? And, and let's, let's identify what your priorities are this coming year because we want to align what we are prioritizing with what you are prioritizing. We want to, we want to level set your expectations and our expectations over what's going to happen over the next year and, and, and how we're going to do it together as a team. And then we also say, okay, now that we've done that, we're going to put an action plan together for you to help you accomplish your goals. And what we're going to do is in the next year at the next state of the business review we're going to review how we did together against what we set out as goals um, for this year and and so we 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 partner with them and and we work together with them and really try to understand the business and then we also gather their feedback say okay now that we've done that tell us what what we could have done better last year and this is another this is another listening post this is another touch point that we're able to gather information on, on what we can be doing better so that we can go back and, and implement improvements like these. Then we also um, worked with the product groups, and, and actually we've got like, oh, like almost 200 different products, and they're broken up into three big, what we call business units, product um, uh, that are just groups of products. And we worked with all those organizations, the problem is, is none of them, they weren't aligned in how they handled the product enhancement request. They all did it their own different ways. Now they had one tool, but there was no policy around the tool. There was no kind of SLA, so to speak, of you know, how when we respond to customers and what we tell them when we respond to them. There was, no, there was no consistency and there was no accountability. There was no accountability for the product managers to actually even go in and analyze or you know, analyze all of the requests and, and um, decide, you know, you know, prioritize them and, and actually take that feedback and, and implement it into the future products. There was no policy around that. Um, and so what we did is we worked with the product groups to create one standardized policy around the product enhancement request process that would give customers feedback on a, on a defined um, amount of time. And even if that feedback was, you know what, sorry, you know, we appreciate the feedback, but we're, we're not going to be able to implement this in our product. Um, you know, in the past, that's kind of where they would leave it. And, and so now in, the, in, in our new process, we say, listen, we're not going to implement this in our product, but we have some third-party solutions, or we have, you know, you know, our professional services can help you build it, or, you know, we help them with alternatives and options if, if the answer is, is we can't implement it in the core product because it's, it, it, it's not consistent with the direction that we're going with the product, but we can help you with a solution that will meet your needs. So each, in, each one of these in and of themselves weren't massive, you know, big sea change type um, um, uh, initiatives, but when you put them together, we, we saw some really, really big uh, impact. So, um, and then I'll talk about that here in just a second. Th this is just a slide to show that we, we have a methodology that we, that we use uh, it, when we gather the data, what we do with it, and how we garner. One of the biggest challenges that we have in, in our industry and in many industries is once you've identified what you need to do for customers, how do you get the entire organization around uh, around the idea that it needs to be done and, and not only just agree that it's a good idea but actually put some skin in the game and actually um, give lend resources and lend you know subject matter experts to to be able um, to uh, to participate uh, and and um, you know create a solution that all those organizations are bought into because they they have ownership in it um, and so that's that's a, a big kind of a big challenge and you know, not as pertinent for smaller companies, but for large companies, this is a big challenge. Uh, love to talk, if any of you throughout this week, if, if you want to talk a little bit more about this um, uh, and the way we do this, it's, it's been real effective for us. So what are the results? So, so when we added those four initiatives together, we saw a 10% increase in overall customer experience metrics um, after the first year. So like I said, the customer experience metrics are kind of longer term measurements, but um, after a year of starting these, 
um, we saw a 10% increase, which is massive. I mean, there's nothing, nothing ever in our company. And they had, we, we actually had pretty good, I mean, they had industry, um, you know, they were very much in alignment in uh, industry customer experience before um, we implemented this program, but we saw a 10% in uptick in that, which was dramatic. Um, the accounts in the program were 7% better when compared with accounts not in the program. Um, and then we had a 20% de decrease in tr trouble ticket volume, which was another unintended you know, benefit of, of implementing these is what we've noticed is now all of a sudden they're contacting our support organization less and less and less because the technical people are having more interaction with the, with the engineers, they're understanding a little bit better, um, you know, they're not escalating things within their organization um, a, as quickly. We had a 12%, or excuse me, um, oh, the, and, the, and the ticket volume was 12% less um, than, the, than the accounts that were not in the program overall. Um, we had also a 12% revenue increase and an 8% renewal increase with these accounts, which again, that was never, that was never money was not ever even a, we, we, we took an approach that we're not doing this because we think it's going to be financially beneficial to the company. We're doing this because we want to make stronger customers. We want to make happier customers because we feel that good things, my philosophy always is, is if you have a happy customer, good things are going to happen. And, and a lot of times, a lot of really good things you don't even design or even have in mind when you, when you implement. Um, so takeaways, uh, we, you can take a look at that, but the, the idea here is, is that the data is only as good as the interpretation of the data, right? So you need to be really be careful about really understanding what the data is telling you before you decide to implement things based on that data. Um, your customer's perspective is really the only perspective that counts. Uh, and and I, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir uh, on, on that one. So actually, that's why I love presenting to this crowd right here, because you're all converted to the faith, and I love it. Um, listening points, uh, listening posts uh, uh, at the touch points will provide you actionable data, right? Customer experience gives us directional data, but the actual touch points and the listening points is going to give you the actionable data. Um, friction at the customer touch points um, will cause customers to follow the path of least resistance. We all know that. Uh, and then reduction um, of the touch point friction will result in an overall increase in the customer experience. You know, my philosophy is, is if you, if you handle the touch points and you reduce the friction of the touch points, you don't even need to look at your high level s customer experience data because you know it's going to be good. Um, programmatic improvements tailored to address specific pain points are, are needed for sustaining the improvement. So, you know, if, 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 you, if you tweak something and don't really programmatically change it, then it's, it's going to be a temporary fix and it's event, you're going to be eventually back in the place um, where you were before. So instituting programmatic change is, is the way that you can um, enjoy sustained improvement in these areas. And with that, we are going to wow our customers. Um, any questions? Um, how much time do I have for questions? Uh, about five minutes. About five minutes? Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, if, if we don't get to all your questions, I'll be here, I'll be here all week, tip your waitress. Um, <laughs> any questions? Wow. I have a question uh, for the top customer program. How did you guys work to identify what top customers would <laughs> be included? Was it based on spend or other metrics? That is a very, very good question. And actually, when I came to McAfee, they were really, really struggling with this because they wanted a top customer program. They just they were really struggling with, with how to implement it. So they wanted to go with a straight revenue, um, but that, I think everybody in this room understands that that's kind of a flawed way of looking at it because just straight revenue does not take into consideration. Is that customer growing? Are they shrinking? You know, what, is, what are the historicals? Are they strategic? Are they not strategic? What are, what are some of the initiatives that we're working on jointly? Do we see opportunities with them? So there was, what, what we did is we took a look at about five or six different um, factors when we took, spend was one of them, but, but not just straight spend. Um, because we want to take a look at what the future opportunity was with, with those customers as well. So we took a look at, you know, what is the spend over time um, so that we could see if, if, they're, if they're investing in, in, in McAfee or if they're divesting in McAfee. Um, we want to take a look at, you know, what, what type of strategic opportunities do we have with this customer? Do, they, um, do, do we feel that there's some, you know, joint, um, you know, efforts and abilities that we have with them that could really, um, you know, we're, we're assessing all the time new business models. I mean, we're taking a look at things like managed services and other things that you know we could we could partner with some of these customers on that really uh, could be could be good things for us. Um, and so we took we took a look of about five different um, 
uh, factors on, on deciding which our top customers were. Yes. How tough is it in the uh, B2B tech industry, you know, where you have these direct sales teams to get these programs going versus a uh, consumer industry? Oh, that's a good question. So, so, and that's a good point because McAfee has, oh geez, we, we've got a little over 3 million customers um, and 95% of those customers are consumer customers and about 5%, but of course it's the whole, you know, it's actually transcends the 80-20 rule, but you know, the majority of our revenue actually comes from our enterprise customers. So it, it, it is a completely different, completely different model. And, and when we implement customer experience initiatives for our consumer, it's vastly different than what we do for, for our enterprise customers. Um, the enterprise customers are easier in some regards because you actually have um, account teams, right? Or you have um, people that have a, an established relationship with those customers. And so, in, in some regards, it's easier because you, you have a, you know, a beachhead in there and you can really gather pretty good information, uh, assuming that they've got a good relationship with, with the customers. Uh, the, the downside is that, you know, it, it's a more political environment to try to work in, meaning um, uh, what you have to do is you really have to get your salespeople, and, the, and, and it's not this, just the salespeople, it's this sales organization, because you've got to have buy-in at the very top. Because if, if there's not buy-in there, the salespeople are driven by what we incent them with, right? They're driven by commission and revenue. And the other stuff, when we come in and say, hey, we, we have this really cool customer experience, you know, thing that we want to do with your account, you know, and they're going to say, okay, great, how's it going to impact my commission? Well, we think it's going to be really great, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be awesome. And, you know, and they're saying, well, you know, how much? And, and so they're very, very... Um, um, and, until they see results. And this is one of the things we talk about on, on this program is you have to provide kind of, <laughs> they're really our internal customers. You have to provide references, right? If we can prove some success in one account, then we can take that into these other accounts. And the account teams, the more you do that, the more you know, word of mouth goes through the, the sales organizations. And pretty soon you get to a point where they start welcoming you in uh, and, and working with you because they've seen the results and they've heard the results of the other account teams that have uh, benefited from what you're doing with them. And, and, and so that's different. Now, with the consumer side, you know, th th it's a much more massive thing, and, and you don't have that direct one-to-one -one relationship uh, as much with the consumers. You do in some, in some instances, but the vast majority of our, you know, two and a half million uh, consumer customers, um, you know, they've purchased our, our, our product because a pop-up screen came up on their desktop, and they decided they needed, it, you know, antivirus, and that's about as much interaction as they have with us. Uh, from a personal level, and so we have to we have to create avenues to be able to gather that feedback and, and gather that information from them in a way where it's not having a, a, a conversation with them, but is rather more um, you know what are their behaviors, you know how do they download, how long, you know uh, how often do they renew, um, you know what kind of plan do they get, and then what are their interactions with our customer service when if they do call in, you know what we capture and we we codify so we have reason codes. Whenever we take any, any kind of um, customer service call, uh, at the end of the call, um, it's forced for the customer service agent to have to say, what was the reason for this call? Um, you know, what, what did the customer want? You know, where, you know did we provide them with, with the solution? And then we also have a quality group within that, and of course this is, you know, blocking and tackling for customer service organizations that, you know, we have a quality group that listens to the calls and they audit and monitor and, and, and they score it based on what we, you know, want that experience to be. And whatnot. So it's a it's a completely different animal. Okay, last question. Hi, David. Um, what is the most effective um, listening post that you use? Um, that's one. And the second thing was also what does the C um, if you could shed some light on the C metric that you use, was it a, a net promoter score that you used to determine the ten percent increase? So the, the the metric for which for uh, for which part uh, the the most effective metric for oh the, our, our our overall most sure. effective customer experience metric. Okay, good. Um, okay, so first of all, um, uh, the the first question around what what's the most effective listing post um, that we have? It it really depends upon what what customer we're trying to get information from. 
because that, that will differ. Now, in this particular example that I used, the, it, it was with our enterprise customers, and our most um, effective listening post was actual you know, direct interaction with those customers because they, our, our enterprise customers get, they get surveyed, like every time we close a support, not every, not every support ticket, but you know, every like fifth support ticket that they enter into our system, they get a survey request. How, you know, rate your experience with this. We, they get the, you know, the net promoter and, uh, and Walker surveys that come out. They just get like, you know, lambasted with, with all these surveys and, and requests for feedback. And of course, the, the response rates for those are ex extremely low, right? I mean, if, you, if, we, if we have like a 5% response rate on some of these surveys, we're like, oh, this is great. Um, what we found was the most effective was we, we, we took a look at who our top, who we believed were our top 100 customers based on the, the information that, that we used to, to assess that. And we actually went and had conversations with them. And um, we went to the account team and I said, hey, listen, I wanna come in and talk to your customer. And they're like, oh, great, you know, that's, that's really great. And, and uh, because I wanna get some feedback. And they're like, that's great. Our customers like been wanting to give feedback. And so uh, I'd go and I, I, would, I would sit down with the customer and I had a, a list of, you know, 10 things, that, 10, 10 questions I wanted to ask. And I, I didn't go, okay, question number one. Duh, 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 duh. I had a conversation with them. And through that conversation, I, you know, basically brought those points up. And I was able to gather that, that feedback because in a conversation you get candid information, right? If somebody responds to a survey, they're looking at the question, they're like, well, do they mean this or do they mean that? Well, I think they mean this, so I'll go ahead and put that. Um, and, and you may or may not really get truly, that conversation that comes out. And you're able to kind of clarify and, 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 and have a two-way conversation. So for us, that was by far the most effective listing point. I mean, it was obviously much lower volume because you just can't scale that. But for what we were doing with a subset, that was the most effective for us in that, in, in that instance. Um, then as far as the overall customer experience metric, um, <laughs> And, and this, you, you guys can debate this as much as you want, but for me, revenue growth is the greatest customer experience metric that we have with our enterprise customers because if they're happy, they're gonna do more business with you. Now, there are some factors you have to consider, like, you know, is their business tanking? And, you know, that may, you know, kind of break out. Of, there's, so there's some external um, uh, things that you have to look at, but generally speaking, assuming that their business is stable, um, revenue growth. Is, is, is to me the most important uh, customer uh, experience metric. Uh, and that comes from a person who really hates assigning dollar figures to customer experience. 